Snake Bros Snake Force, serving the community one mystery at a time. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau, deep in the heart of Texas. So we had a uh, fantastic swap cast with Conspiracy Normal last week. Uh, that was the week we got back from our trip. So we haven't had a chance to talk about that trip yet, so that's pretty much what we're going to do on this podcast, right? That's yeah. the plan. Yeah. I got a bunch of news stories. Too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of listener communications, and uh, I have a news story as well. So, so as far as the trip is concerned, um, I have a lot of follow-up work to do yeah. that I haven't done, and uh, so I'm going to be... So do you want to hold off on the... Trip stuff. I mean, we can give it like a basic rundown, but yeah, I want to go into detail just for my own research on, right. on some of the stuff we looked at and uh, present that on the podcast. But I'm also wanting to make sure that the way I present them is respecting the people who did the work. Yeah, that I'm trying to get a hold of. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know you know all this, but I'm saying this for right. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally, I totally agree. And, uh, but I mean, we have the other stuff that we did that's not, yeah, so sensitive sure. that we can talk about. Um, stay tuned. Yeah, yeah, stay, folks, stay tuned for uh, further reports. Yeah, uh, the watcher is here with us, but he is having mic problems still. At least. <laughs> um, <laughs> at least that's what I'm blaming it on because I don't think it's my problem <laughs> right yeah he's trying to say it's, it's on pretty, our end it's, it's a pretty safe bet it's pretty, that it's, it's on yeah. his end <laughs> who is the person that has all the mic problems all the time it's <laughs> not us so it's a good bet that it's his problem <laughs> <laughs> and what do you have to say about that watcher <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Watcher? You, you out there, buddy? Yeah. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give us a bunch of pyramids. <laughs> or a bunch of ellipses. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and do... A space Weather News. <laughs> From spaceweather.com. <laughs> The next stream of solar wind. A minor stream of solar wind flowing from a southern hole in the sun's atmosphere is expected to reach Earth on October 3rd or 4th. Its impact probably won't spark a full-fledged geomagnetic storm. Lesser geomagnetic unrest and auroras are possible, however, especially around the Arctic Circle. Also, a Steve storm hits Scandinavia. When a stream of solar wind hit Earth's magnetic field last Friday, September 27th, forecasters expected an aurora storm around the Arctic Circle. Turns out it was more of a Steve storm. Many sky watchers in Scandinavia saw the mauve ribbon of light. Mauve, that is uh, purple for those of you in Lake Hills. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> a mauve ribbon of light for the very first time. Goran Strand photographed the event from Handel, Sweden. I finally got to see Steve, says Strand, who is a veteran observer of auroras, but had never seen Steve before. It all started when I noticed a faint, faint green corona outside of our mountain cabin. I grabbed my camera gear and headed out into the night. At my first stop along this road, I encountered Steve. Steve, which is strong thermal emission velocity enhancement, looks like an aurora, but it is not. The phenomenon is caused by hot... Uh, 3,000 degrees Celsius ribbons of gas flowing through Earth's magnetosphere at speeds exceeding 6 kilometers per second. These ribbons appear during some geomagnetic, geomagnetic storms, revealing them to, by their soft purple glow. So Steve normally appears at latitudes around plus 50 north to f plus 55 north on rare occasions, dipping down into the 40s. This case, however, the sightings were at unusually high latitudes, topping plus 60 north in Handel, Sweden. 
the, the, uh, this event shows that the habitat of Steve may reach farther north than previously thought. I remember Steve. <laughs> <laughs> also, green flash on Venus. You've heard of green flashes on the sun, but what about green flashes on Venus? They are real, and now is a good time to observe them. All you need is a body of water, a sunset, and a telescope. I saw one last week, reports eyewitness Paolo Palma of Rome, Italy. At the end of the day, on September 26, I was watching the sunset from my deck overlooking the Tyrian, uh, wow, Tyrrhenian Sea. A fragment of the setting sun seemed to break away and turn a strong shade of green like a leaf falling on the nearby sea. It was a green flash, something that happens fairly often to the setting sun when temperature inversions and strong thermal gradients develop above a sea surface. The sky was clear, continues Palma, and I had my Dobsonian telescope with me. I decided to swing my telescope up to Venus, which itself was only a few degrees above the horizon. As it sank towards the sea, it had a green flash, too. There's a little picture of it. Green flash right on top of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> green flashes on the sun happen because the low atmosphere acts like a prism, splitting the solar disk into primary RGB colors. Temperature gradients above the sea surface can magnify the green into an eye-catching flash. It is a type of mirage. The same physics that make green flashes on the sun can make green flashes on Venus. In fact, green flashes on Venus may be even easier to create. Atmospheric optics expert Les Cowley explains, planets and especially point source stars need less stringent conditions as evidenced by Paolo's observation of Venus <clears throat> spreading into a color strip while it was still well above the horizon. Mirages just do not get that high. Normal atmospheric refraction is sufficient to do this. When Venus approaches the horizon, mirage condi conditions kick in, magnifying the green for a truly verdant flash. Now is a good time to observe Ven Venusian green flashes. The second planet is just emerging from solar conjunction. So when the sun sets into the waves, Venus is not far behind, sampling the same thermal conditions as the green flashing sun. Seaside sky watchers should be alert for the phenomenon in the evenings ahead. That's cool. Yeah. And the watchers put some pictures here of the uh, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. The one that they had that this guy took a picture of was right. Looks like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Rainbows. Yeah. That's it's cool. Night rainbows. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yep. <clears throat> What do you got? You got stories or should yeah. we do? Okay. Yeah. Uh, at midnight on Mars, the red planet's magnetic field sometimes starts to pulsate in ways that have never before been observed. The cause is currently unknown. This is from National Geographic. Um, dot com. Mysterious magnetic pulses discovered on Mars. That's just one of the stunning preliminary findings from NASA's very first robotic geophysicist there, the InSight lander. Since touching down in November 2018, the spacecraft has been gathering intel to help scientists better understand our neighboring planet's innards and evolution, such as taking the temperature of its upper crust, recording the sounds of alien quakes, and measuring the strength and direction of the planet's magnetic field. As revealed during a handful of presentations this week at a joint meeting of the European Planetary Science Congress and the American Astronomical Society, the early data suggests the magnetic uh, mach machinations of Mars are marvelously mad. <laughs> In addition to the odd magnetic pulsations, the lander's data show that the Martian crust is far more powerfully magnetic than scientists expected. What's more, the lander has picked up on a very peculiar electrically conductive layer about 2.5 miles thick, deep beneath the planet's surface. It's far too early to say with any certainty, but there is a chance that this layer could represent a global reservoir of liquid water. Uh. On Earth, groundwater is a hidden sea locked up in sand, soil, and rocks. If something similar is found on Mars, then we shouldn't be surprised, says Jenny Radenbaugh, a planetary scientist at Brigham Young University, who was not involved with the work. <laughs> what? Just get some random scientist to say one thing? We shouldn't be surprised. Wow, I'm going to quote them and put them in my story. But if these results bear out, a liquid region at this scale on modern Mars has enormous implications for the potential for life, past or present. 
So far, none of these data have been through peer review, and details about the initial findings and interpretations will undoubtedly be tweaked over time. Still, the revelations provide a stunning showcase for insight, a robot, a robot that has the potential to revolutionize our comprehension of Mars and other rocky worlds across the galaxy. A tale of two worlds. Earth has a major global magnetic field thanks to its rotation and churning, iron-rich liquid outer core. We know that this field has been around for a while and that it has, it has shifted about fairly dramatically across geological epochs based on natural records of its strength and direction trapped in specific minerals within the crust. The history of Mars' magnetic field is similarly archived in its crust, as scientists learned in 1997 thanks to data from the Mars Global Surveyor Orbiter. The same zoo of magnetic minerals that exist on Earth exist on Mars, says Robert Lillis, a planetary space physicist at the University of California, Berkeley, who wasn't involved with the new research. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, a planetary space physicist sounds like a great job. Yeah. And why are they quoting all these people who are not involved in this research? The orbiter detected... Just, the these are just the random scientists that are nearby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lazy journalists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the orbiter detected the red planet's magnetism from 60 to 250 miles above the surface, and it found that the crustal magnetic field is 10 times stronger than, Earth, uh, than Earth's is when measured from the same height above the surface. This suggests that once upon a time, Mars also had a major global magnetic field. Unlike Earth, though, Mars got unlucky. Around four billion years ago, its convulsing outer core appears to have seized up, causing a collapse in its global magnetic field. Left with a weak magnetic shield to defend itself, an outpouring of radiation from the sun, known as the solar wind, gradually stripped away much of its ancient atmosphere, turning a potentially life-supporting water-rich world into a cold desert. Hmm. Grasping why these two planets had such different fates requires the best possible measurements of Mars's magnetic ghosts. But from orbit, the strength of this remnant magnetic field has poor resolution. It's like looking at a crowd of people from far away. If many are wearing red shirts and a few are wearing blue, a camera at a distance will largely register the preponderance of red. But get close with the same camera, and those all-important blue hues will be more clearly seen. Hipsters. <laughs> <laughs> The same is true for magnetic measurements, says Dave Bryan, a researcher of atmospheric and space physics from the University of Colorado, not involved with the work. <laughs> <laughs> the closer you get, the more structure you are able to pick out. You know what this you know what the, probably the deal is? It hasn't been peer reviewed yet, so none of the people that are involved with the work will talk to the journalists. That's probably you're probably exactly right. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about what people not involved with the work think about this. <laughs> Journalist. <laughs> Mysteries at Midnight. Insight's magnetometer, the first placed on the Martian surface, gave scientists their best look yet at the crustal magnetic field, and it gave them a bit of a shock. The magnetic field near the robot was around 20 times stronger than what had been predicted based on past orbital measurements. Brian, who is familiar with the InSight data, says that this strong, stable magnetic signal is coming from rocks near InSight, but whether they are deep underground or nearer the surface is currently unclear. That identification matters, Burns. Uh, I guess he misspelled Brian because yeah. now he's spelled B Y R N E. <laughs> Bjorn says because if it's coming from younger rocks near the surface, it would imply that a strong magnetic field persisted around Mars for longer than we currently think. Perhaps even more puzzling, Insight also found that the crustal magnetic field near its location jiggled about every now and then. This wobbling is known as a magnetic pulsation, explains Matthew Fillingham a space physicist at the University of California, Berkeley, and a member of the InSight science team. All right. <laughs> Where's my triumphant music? <laughs> I need... Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> These pulses are fluctuations in the strength or direction of the magnetic field, and they are not entirely unusual. Plenty of them happen on Earth and Mars, triggered by upper atmospheric chaos, the action of the solar wind, and kinks in the planet's magnetic bubbles, among other things. What's strange is that these Martian wobbles happen at local midnight, 
as if responding to the demands of an unseen nocturnal timer. Hmm. InSight is near Mars's equator, and in the same geographic position on Earth at that same time of night, you don't see these types of magnetic pulsations. Nighttime pulsations on Earth tend to happen at higher latitudes and are linked to the northern and southern lights. Right now, the ones on Mars have no clear source, but the scientists have at least one suspect in mind. Although it no longer has a potential global magnetic field, a potent global magnetic field, Mars is surrounded by a weak magnetic bubble created as the solar wind interacts with its thin atmosphere. This bubble is in turn compressed by the solar wind's magnetic field, causing part of a bubble to take on a tail-like shape. At midnight, InSight's spot on Mars is aligned with this tail, and as it passes through, the tail may be plucking the surface magnetic field like a guitar string. Hmm. Unpeer-reviewed theory. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, pretty cool story. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, it's a pretty long article. There's a lot more, but I'll uh, leave it with that. Yeah. Well, I actually have a, a story about a camera that may not have a problem with a couple of blue shirts and a large amount of red yeah. shirt people. Uh, but hold on. I need to increase, increase the amount of man-made climate change in here. Because, uh, <laughs> oh, it's just not, it's, it's too hot. It's hot. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So this was sent to us, uh, by a good friend of the show and fellow $50 Dynasty band member, GMA. Hey, you dirty, <laughs> you dirty bastard. <laughs> what are you sending Russ the stories for? Uh, it came to Brothers of the Serpent. Um, email. Moving, this is from Engadget.com, moving the largest high-performance lens ever built. Oh, yeah, he did send me that one. Yeah. Sorry, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the most interesting telescopes need to live in space. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST, will sit on top of a mountain in Chile some 8,800 uh, 8, feet up and snap 3.2 gigapixel images of the sky every 20 seconds. So that's 3,200 megapixels. All told, it will be able to snap digital images of the entire southern sky every few nights. By taking relatively long 15-second exposures, scientists will be able to study the early universe, track dimly lit asteroids, and better understand dark energy. Yeah, right. Right. The LSST cameras has 32 times the resolution of the best consumer shooters out there in order to image the maximum amount of sky possible. It's also the largest CCD, which is charge coupled device, mosaic, in the world, according to the contractor that worked on it. <laughs> it's, it's not a random contractor, yeah. A contractor who is not familiar with the camera at all. <laughs> to, <laughs> to focus all that light, the telescope has a very wide 3.5 degree diameter field of view and an extremely fast aperture giving it an immense 319 meters squared, degrees squared, intendu, I'm not sure what that word is, three times more than the current best ter current telescopes. To achieve that feat, it will use three mirrors with the primary at 8.4 meters or 28 feet in diameter, the secondary at 3.4 meters and the tertiary at five meters. <laughs> Aperture science. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's who did this. <laughs> <laughs> you <wouldn't> watch her. <laughs> the challenge is to get rid of any aberrations, which is where the lens comes into play. Look at that. There's a picture of the lens there. That's awesome. Yeah. SLAC said that the 1.55 meter or 5.1 foot L1 lens shown above is the largest high performance optical lens ever fabricated. It was designed by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory based on work spanning nearly two decades and fabricated using very advanced optic systems. It was built along with the uh, 1.2 diameter L2 companion lens by Ball Aerospace and subcontractor Arizona Optical Systems in a process that took five years. Careful where you point that thing. <laughs> <laughs> the success of the fabrication of this unique optical assembly is a testament to LLNL's world-leading expertise in large optics built on decades of experience in the construction of the world's largest and most powerful laser systems, said physicist Scott Olivier, who was not involved in building any of this at all. <laughs> <laughs> the camera itself is the size of a small car and weighs more than three tons. Each massive image it produces will be a gold mine for scientists 
and it's expected that the LSST will detect about 20 billion galaxies during a 10-year time frame, while also creating time-lapse movies that could re uh, reveal changes in galaxies and stars. The images won't just benefit scientists. Anyone with a computer will be able to fly through the universe past objects 100 million times fainter than can be observed with the unaided eye. SLAC and LSST hope it will become a platform for crowdsourced astronomical discoveries. The LSST is scheduled to start imaging the southern sky by 2023. Suffice to say, this is one valuable piece of glass, so moving it from Tucson, Arizona to the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory in Menlo Park was a bit of an event according to uh, SLAC's site. And yes, it was apparently shipped by FedEx. <laughs> <laughs> but that's cool. It's going to be crowdsourced, man. I can't wait to check that out. Heck yeah. 2023. Four and years away. In other space news, uh, this one was sent by Ty through our secret thread. Oh, yes. <laughs> our disgusting meme hole. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, we have a deal. Like he, he's not going to send you any of the stories. Oh, oh, it's a secret thread just between you guys. <laughs> That's right. All I was right. like, don't send Russ the stories. <laughs> he's always got stories. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So this is from uh, Vice dot com. Mysterious cosmic rays shooting from the ground in Antarctica. Whoa! Could break physics. <laughs> So News flash. Is not associated with the study. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Physics is already broken. Yeah. <laughs> NASA went searching for micro black holes in Antarctica. Is that? What? That, that can't be right. <laughs> Instead, it detected cosmic rays <laughs> shooting from the ground, and some physicists think it could be evidence of a supersymmetric particle. Mm. There are no particles. <laughs> <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> There's something strange happening beneath the surface of Antarctica, and it's got nothing to do with Nazi UFOs. <laughs> Rather, researchers are arguing that a decade-old experiment may have furnished the first evidence of a new type of particle that has evaded detection by some of the most sophisticated particle accelerators for years. If they could turn out to be correct, it would change physics as we know it. In 2006, NASA-affiliated researchers launched Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna, ANITA, a balloon experiment meant to observe high-energy particles that shower the Earth from space, also known as cosmic rays. During ANITA's flight, however, its instruments uh, observed something that physicists could not explain. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm... <laughs> been listening to a bunch of physicists lately, and I'm getting mad at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, in addition to detecting cosmic rays from space, Anita also detected cosmic rays shooting from the ground as the high-altitude balloon drifted over the Antarctic ice sheet. I'm sure it wasn't like a, a reflection? I know. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> like, they, they make giant Christmas trees of uh, collisions, but I don't know. Well... This is also a long story, so it might take us a while to get to the okay. first uh, non-peer-reviewed theory. <laughs> Physicists have long known that high-energy particles can penetrate deep into Earth, but none of the particles predicted by the standard model, the most accurate model of physics that has ever existed, <laughs> should be able to pass all the way through the planet. On Tuesday, a group of researchers led by the Pennsylvania State University physicist Derek Fox posted a new theory of these upward-shooting cosmic rays to archive or R-X-I-V, yeah. A-R-X-I-V, that suggests they could be evidence of a particle that lies beyond the standard model. If Fox and his colleagues are correct, it would be the first evidence of a particle beyond the standard model of physics, the most accurate description of the universe humans have ever known. <laughs> God. Good grief. <laughs> Tell me again how accurate it is. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go on? Yeah. Let's, <laughs> okay. Uh, the first Anita mission launched from the McMurdo base in Antarctica in December 2006. The experiment flew to an altitude of about 120,000 feet, where it's been a month drifting over Antarctica. It was equipped with sensors designed to detect pulses of radiation produced when ultra-high energy ne uh, neutrinos, a nearly massless particle with no electric charge, interact with the Antarctic ice sheet. In the early 60s, the Soviet physicist Gurgen Askarian theorized that when a high-energy particle interacted with a dense dielectric medium, 
a type of insulating material that doesn't conduct electricity, it would produce a shower of secondary charged particles whose radiation can be detected by standard radio antennas. This interaction, now known as the Ascarian effect, allows physicists to detect particles that hardly interact with normal matter, like neutrinos, by observing their secondary effects. The How does a particle with no mass <laughs> and no charge interact with stuff? <laughs> 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 That's a good question. I don't know. The goal of Anita mission was to use an array of antennas to detect the Ascarian. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. A S K A R Y A N. Ascarian mm. radiation produced from high energy neutrinos interacting with the Antarctic ice sheet. Unlike photons, neutrinos don't lose their energy as they propagate through the universe. This means that they can carry information from beyond the photon horizon the limit that photon sources are still detectable from Earth and provide a window into, uh, onto the farthest reaches of the universe. Furthermore, some models of physics that are beyond the standard model predict the existence of incredibly small extra dimensions. Some of these theories predict that when cosmic rays interact with ice, this produces micro black holes that open into these dimensions, which could be detected via the Ascarian effect. So they really mm. were looking, looking for, for black micro holes. black holes yeah. in Antarctica. Wow. <laughs> that's, uh, okay. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. We're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. I've heard of micro black holes being caused during the very early Big Bang. Uh, because supposedly the energy levels were so high, energy densities were so high that tiny, you know, tiny amounts of matter could actually collapse into yeah. an event horizon. But because of the Hawking radiation, the entropy, you know, the black holes uh, decay, they supposedly disappear just in tiny, tiny fractions of a second, like yeah. like what happens in particle accelerators. Right. They just they can't last very long. So, <clears throat> yeah. So that that's what they went there to look for, and said they found cosmic rays coming that's out right. of the ground. So yeah. yeah. Although the first Anita mission didn't detect any evidence of micro black holes, it did detect the Ascarian effect, the first time this had ever been observed from electron interactions with ice. Yet the researchers working on Anita also got more than they bargained for when they also detected cosmic rays that appeared to be shooting out of the Antarctic ice sheet. The first Anita mission detected two upward-pointing cosmic ray-like events during its month-long sojourn above Antarctica. Unlike the cosmic rays that come from space and are reflected off the Antarctic ice sheet, which produce vertically polarized pulses of radiation, the two anomalous cosmic rays had nearly horizontal planes of polarization. This suggested that they either didn't originate in space, or if they did, the radiation was produced by particles that had traveled all the way through Earth. That's what I was about to say. They came from the, the from the other side, the other pole. In either case, this type of cosmic ray had never been observed before. So yeah, there that's you go. yeah. So once once I heard that, I was like, okay, they this uh, yeah. because because you have a magnetic field, and the magnetic field is is what helps us helps block cosmic rays, but it also directs them. So I can totally understand how it could help cosmic rays flow through. Okay, the well, I, I think they end up debunking that idea. They do? Let's see. A second mission, Anita mission in 2009, as well as a third mission in 2014, detected another strange upward-pointing cosmic ray. The source of these cosmic rays remain a mystery, but a number of theories have been proposed. Some physicists think these upward-pointing cosmic rays are evidence of the decay of dark matter that exists in the Earth's interior. In February, I mean, they're just, yeah, that's, it's just dark matter. <laughs> Let's just throw this. I'm sorry. Um, in February, John Cherry and Ian Shoemaker suggested that these cosmic rays might be explained by sterile neutrinos, a type of high energy particle that had, that hardly ever interacts with ordinary matter. At first, physicists attempted to explain these strange events as the result of a type of particle called a tau neutrino decaying as it passed through Earth. This would produce an elementary charged particle called a tau lepton, which would produce the type of signature observed by the Anita balloons. There was just one problem. 
Anita observed these uh, the particles coming in at extreme angles, 27 degrees and 35 degrees, that aren't permitted within the standard model of physics. This suggested that either the standard model would have to undergo significant revisions to account for the observation, or, as Derek Fox and his colleagues recently suggested, Anita may have observed the first evidence of a supersymmetric particle. So then they go into describing what, what this what super symmetry symmetry particle is. Yeah. So, oh, we can move on. I. No, you want to hear it? Yeah, I'm actually fascinated by this. Okay. <laughs> I, know, I know we're gonna get those, you know, stick to the ancient origins people <laughs> <laughs> complaining about physics. <laughs> Stick, That's right. It's the stick to the pyramids crowd. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what time we got anyway? Let's check our. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, we're right up on a break. Yeah. Well, let me let me just finish okay. the story. Yeah. All right. The standard model of physics was cobbled together over the course of the past century and currently serves as the most accurate model of physics, uh, of physical. I'm sorry. It serves as the most accurate model of the physical universe ever created. <laughs> Number it, three. <laughs> it describes <laughs> most of the fundamental forces and classifies elementary particles. Although the standard model has proven remarkably successful for making experimental predictions over the last few decades, it's not able to explain everything. Some phenomena, such as gravity, the accelerating expansion of the universe, and neutrino oscillations are not incorporated in the model. Wait, are you saying there's not a theory of gravity? Uh, yeah, I guess so. let's, <laughs> let's not even talk about quantum mechanics. Yeah. <laughs> These deficiencies in the model have led some physicists to begin thinking about ways of obscuring the fact that they don't actually understand everything. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Does it really say no. that? <laughs> <laughs> These deficiencies in the model have led some physicists to begin thinking about physics beyond the standard model, BSM. You may have heard of some of these exotic theories, such as string theory or M theory, but so far there isn't much evidence to support one theoretical version of BSM physics over another. That's a great name. BSM. Yeah. The bullshit model. <laughs> that's, what, <laughs> that's what the watcher said, too. It's bullshit mode. <laughs> bullshit mode. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and bullshit now. <laughs> no, but these are the guys that are trying to look outside the standard model. Yeah, yeah. So we, we shouldn't we give them too give, much crap. They're already getting more. enough grief. Yeah. yeah. In February, physicists, according to the paper posted to Archive this week, however, there are strong reasons to believe that the anomalous cosmic rays seen by Anita could be evidence of a BSM particle. This theory relies on a version of BSM physics called supersymmetry, unlike string theory, which is also called theory of everything, that overhauls the standard model. Supersymmetry merely extends the standard model by adding a new class of massive particles into the mix. Quote, we argue that if the Anita events are correctly interpreted, then they require some beyond the standard model particle. Fox told me on the phone. The likely properties of the particle seem consistent in at least some ways with the predicted properties of the Stau in some supersymmetric models. In supersymmetry, each of the elementary particles in the standard model has a heavier superpartner. Thus, leptons are matched with sleptons, electrons with selectrons, quarks with squarks, and so on. None of these theoretical supersymmetric particles, or sparticles, <laughs> have have been produced in a lab so far, which may be because the particles require too much energy to be made by contemporary particle accelerators, such as the Large Hadron Collider. Thus, some physicists hope to detect them by looking to astrophysical sources, which can produce the requisite amounts of energy to produce these more massive particles. In the case of the upward-pointing cosmic rays, Fox and his colleagues argue that they are consistent with some of the predicted characteristics of the Stau the supersymmetric particle of the tau, which cannot be explained using the standard model of physics. The supersymmetric models predict that the stau passes through Earth from space. It decays into a tau lepton, and as an and as, as yet undetected lowest mass supersymmetric particle before emerging on the other side of Earth, where the lau lepton could be registered by instruments like Anita. Hmm. Okay. I just, I don't know. You're done? Yeah, I'm done with <laughs> particle physics. too many physics. particles. Yeah. Yeah. Particle physics is I think the headline should have been, dead. scientists in danger of being hit in the balls <laughs> by, <laughs> by cosmic rays emerging from the ground. 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> and with that, we shall take our first break. <laughs> Snakes! Welcome back. <clears throat> yeah, so I've been <sighs> been listening to some physics podcasts and yeah, getting really upset. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with uh, not all physicists, but just just the vast majority of them who all the physicists not associated with the podcast you're listening to. <laughs> <laughs> Even those guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to make a yeah, I know. yeah. Uh, they just, I don't know, ignoring the, the problems with the model just so that they can continue to just do whatever they're doing. Yeah. Well, and, and the hundred year long ignoring of the philosophical ramifications of the model that they're using. That's yeah. my big problem. You know, the, the whole like, don't, don't mess around with the fundamentals of quantum mechanics you know, is, uh, yeah, because it's, because it has philosophical or metaphysical ramifications. That's yeah. And uh, shut up and calculate is what that's but, called. But this, it's that, that type of behavior on the part of the majority of physicists. Yeah. That results in stories like this one that are like the most accurate model of the universe that's, we have ever known. That's right. <laughs> 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 how do we know that that's the most accurate one we've ever known? Right. Like humanity, in other words. Yeah. Of course, that's a totally different question, but... Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, I got this one other interesting story um, from CNET.com. Mysterious fireball that crashed and burned wasn't a meteor. Hmm. So it's pretty, I'm not going to read the story on this one, but um, it was in Chile, uh, Chile, this like, meteor or something, this bright burning ball like came down from the sky. And then there's a whole bunch of areas around the, that area that like actually caught on fire and burned. Mm. And so the geologists and all these people went out to the sites and they were trying to, and they have not found any impact proxies basically there, wow. there, there's nothing there that that is telling them that it was a meteor and in, in fact the, they're like it wasn't a meteor wow so it was either they're, they're going to release the uh, results of the tests of the stuff that they're they're collecting uh later in october but you know it could have been perhaps like some space debris or something like that but there's you know m one of the things they were saying is like most of the space debris is tiny is tiny and it won't even make it to the ground. And yeah. Then, you know, so it would, it could be, you know, maybe something very large, some very large piece of space debris that just so happened to make landfall. But mm. it's pretty weird. There's like people with like their backyards caught on fire and stuff, you know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Uh, so, yeah. Hmm. Was not a meteor. And that's because they're not finding, uh, I mean, what kind of proxies are they looking for? Like iridium? Are they looking for metals? Or are they looking for... Uh... They're, yeah, they are looking for metals. They're looking for whatever. Yeah. They're, they're, they're um, collecting samples and soil samples and stuff where the ground was burned. Yeah. <clears throat> and there were multiple areas. <laughs> so, yeah, it says it's very rare for space debris debris to cause damage on the ground as it usually falls in the ocean or remote areas. There have been occasional reports of rocket boosters doing damage following inland launches in China and a video just started playing. <laughs> <laughs> but there are no reports of anyone ever being killed or seriously injured by space junk. Um, so yeah. That's strange. 
Yep, and a lot of people saw the the objects descent. Fl- yeah, and it looked like a class, like a fireball or whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's an image of it. Oh it's yeah, like red. Hmm. They've ruled out a disintegrating meteorite as the cause after failing to find any evidence of space rock at seven points where fires were started. That's that's cool. <clears throat> I mean, it's not cool that people's yards caught on fire, but yeah, it was. Yeah, it was, be, it was a UFO. I'll be interested to see what they come up with. Yeah, that's a. Uh, we're it's definitely, in, definitely a UFO story right there. We're in October. Yeah, we're in October. So maybe the results yeah, this, will be. This just happened. Um, yeah, you said that they'll release the results of the test in October. Later, so. later this month. Yeah, yeah, later this month. It'll cool. happen. The story is October first. Ah, uh, so. Wow. All right. What do you got? I've got a. Uh, I've got a bunch of listener emails. Uh, I mean, we di- we didn't we weren't really able to go through any last week, so got, yeah, they've been see. stacking up. <clears throat> this one's great from Shannon. It says hello, bros. UK posse here. Because of my love for Randall, I found Grimerica and then inevitably Brothers of the Serpent. FYI, <laughs> <laughs> your glossary of terms is thoroughly embedded within my vocab. People look at me like I'm crazy, although this was always the case anyhow. (laughs) In quotes, you know the butt flaps narrative. Come on, keep up. (laughs) You two brothers are a pleasure to listen to. I wish that all families were so loving and had such a magical connection and rapport. You evoke whole body laughter and happiness within me, so oh my gods. Thank you both for the podcast and for existing in general. So, I dreamed about my own shoulder rivers last night. (laughs) But sadly, they were only on the sleeves of my shirt. Damn it. But then my shoulder blades became sore and out sprang forth the cooked bacon strips. A little disturbing being a vegetarian, but yes, I had bacon wings. Please find an attached digital illustration to document the discovery of the true meaning of the archaic Mesopotamian stone relief of Kishar. Enjoy. Bros, be well, be safe. Sending love and good vibes your way. Shannon. And she has this picture... She's taking one of the <laughs> the Anunnaki from the Sumerian cylinder seals and giving him bacon, bacon wings, bacon strips <laughs> coming out of his shoulders. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> shoulder bacon, shoulder blade bacon is what she calls it. That's uh, hilarious. I'll stick this picture in the show notes. <clears throat> Thank you, Shannon. That was <laughs> that really came that cracked me up, man. I. I got that early in the morning when we were up in Vermont, and I was laughing my ass off reading that. Uh, Let's see. Okay, this is from Teresa. Love you guys. Discovered your podcast through Where Did the Road Go? The 411 episodes. Really enjoying your recent interview of Soraya, and I just had to say that I dream about my cell phone all the time. Unfortunately, it's usually a pivotal component in my almost nightly anxiety nightmares. (laughs) Keep up the amazing snaky work, Teresa. (laughs) Wow. Uh, that didn't happen. (laughs) (laughs) You made that up. (laughs) Yeah. Sarai has also explained, he said, he said, uh, he he now keeps track of cell phone dreams (laughs) and he's telling me about them. So no one had cell phone dreams until Until I brought it up. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, sorry. Changing the, uh, you're changing the, the other realm. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Mm, okay, this is a good so, so this is from Ryan. I probably should resp- Brian, I'm going to respond to you in text as well, but I wanted to read this on the on the show. Hey guys, I have listened to your show a few times and have really enjoyed it. It is a more serious look at some of the topics that I find interesting, but which are unfortunately polluted by poor work. I'll be going away for four months uh, <clears throat> where I usually bring books to read, I would like to request a recommendation from you guys. I really like a serious look at pre-ancient history, the type of stuff you spoke about in the Conspiranormal podcast. Much appreci- appreciated. So, he's asking for a book list. Hmm. So, I'll send I'll, I'll send you a list in text, buddy, but uh, you can't go wrong with um, Forgotten Civilization by Robert Schock. That's a great one. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
obviously any of the Graham Hancock stuff you want to look at, Sign in the Seal, uh, Fingerprints of the Gods, Underworld. These are all really good. America Before, uh, Magicians of the Gods. You probably could bring that whole list of books. What was the, the David Hatcher Childress one, too? That oh, yeah, one. Technology of the Gods. Yeah, really and good. the Martin Sweatman book. Awesome yes. Too. Um, so if you want a closer look at Gobekli Tepe. Prehistory Decoded. Yeah, Prehistory Decoded is great. Uh, the uh, Walter Bosley's Secret Missions series is fantastic. Uh, I really recommend the Richard Fr- Sir Richard Francis Burton book. So... Anyway, but I will respond in text as well. Send you an email and give you a list. He just pulled over. He's like writing it down. Yeah. (laughs) I'll do it. (laughs) (laughs) So this is really cool. Uh, This is also, let's see. Should I read this on here? Yeah, so I want to read this here. This is sent from David, uh, who is also the, I believe he's the, uh, let me make sure this is right. Uh, didn't even... Yes, this is the this is the guy who has been telling us about how to properly smoke pipes, uh, tobacco yes. pipes. Um, <clears throat> but this is a different. So he says the Edfu text in English, the first mini installment. Okay, hello, Snake Brothers. I wrote some days back in a YouTube comment on one of your really excellent conversations with Randall. He's talking about the Cosmographia podcast. Which you can, he, I saw this comment from him. It was on the, you can find it on the Geocosmic Rex YouTube channel. That's Brad's YouTube channel. That's where he has been posting the uh, Cosmography of videos. Um, so he says, really excellent conversation with Randall about how I would be, I would, so, okay. I wrote some days back on a YouTube comment about, on one of your really excellent conversations with Randall about how I would be translating some of the Germans work on the original text of the Temple of Horus at Edfu. In order to substantiate or falsify some of Graham's comments, I think he's talking about Graham Hancock. Graham's comments, maybe he means uh, Graham Dunlop. (laughs) He could. (laughs) Graham's comments about these texts containing the Egyptian flood myth that some Egyptologists say does not exist. Here is the result of my initial brief look after sorting through some of the exhaustive but very well-organized German website from the University of something I can't pronounce. Göttingen, do you know how to say that? Which one? Right there. Göttingen. Okay. <laughs> Göttingen. 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 I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. <laughs> Just throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> Initial impressions. Much of this is focused on Hathor. It describes how she was, she was once angry at humanity after she, she as the luminous eye of Ra, detached from the sun, but when calmed and pleased with ritual sistrum music, she transforms into the quote-unquote brightly feathered one. This uses the Egyptian word behedeti, meaning the winged sun disc. Mm. This certainly sounds like the kind of hairy star or Helios chariot type myths where a different sun, one with appendages, presages a great destruction. And apparently there is symbolic connection to an alchemical symbol of a winged sun over a sepulcher filled with water. So that is interesting. Randall would likely know what that refers to. These documents contain a nice plan view of the temple with a fascinating interior layout. Apparently the priests thought it important to express sacred geometry. Certainly the specific ratios of the inner spaces are listed. These geometric arrangements must have some deliberate sacred meaning. They may well have acoustic properties. In the sacred ritual, it is the music that makes Hathor, quote-unquote, pleased and, quote-unquote, unify her, uh, unify with her newly peaceful and non-wrathful aspect as the sun disc. By the way, this disc is a very similar netter, or neater, to what Akhenaten called the Aten, that of early monotheism, Egyptian prayers being quoted in Psalms and all that. I have not yet found direct mentions of flooding, but would not be surprised to truly see it in there and would be fascinated to explore the context. Egyptian texts come with heaps of philosophy and metaphysics and allusions built right into every talismanic image. I attached a a significant page here with some of my notes. More is forthcoming. If you get a chance to alert Randall, please let me know. He'd love all this, and I don't know if he has gotten a chance to go over over it with the German, the dense websites, and all. All the best, David. So... (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. So he's, this is awesome, guy, man. I'm going to, we are going to, I am going to tell Randall about this and get this stuff to Randall, but I wanted to read it on our podcast as well. 
So thank you so much for that. <clears throat> but yeah, that that uh, the Hathor coming out of the sun with appendages. She gets angry basically and comes out of the sun, and she's now a, a separate sun with arms rays coming out of her. That's very. Uh, and, the, you know, you see those images of Akhenaten with the Aten in the sky with all the yeah. rays coming down. The And she was, Hathor is also the Eye of Ra. So there's all these cataclysmic space, into, uh, you know, space events basically yeah. encoded in this. Like solar events. Almost yes. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Or a giant comet circling around the sun. and Yeah. Or <laughs> crashing into the sun, creating a solar event. Yeah, I mean. exactly. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, uh, Scotty Baldwin sent us his schedule. Scotty, thanks for the email. Sorry I haven't gotten back to you on that. I'm going to. He asked us, he gave us a list of where he's going in China, and he wants to know what cool things can he go look at. <laughs> so, <laughs> Scotty, I'm going to get back to you on that, buddy. Uh, but just off the top of my head, I don't see the long view in here. But it's the Longyu province, so if you're ever in the Longyu province, go see the Longyu grottos, please. That would be awesome. But I will look these other places up and check my archives and see what I got. Cool. We got some. We got a donation comment from Robert. Y'all have expanded my mind three hat sizes, <laughs> <laughs> and my reading list into my nineties. I'm thirty four. <laughs> <laughs> Still working through the back uh, backlog episodes, but I love your show. You've got a snake bro in Indiana. All right. So, yeah, bro. Thanks. Sent us pie. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also I wanted to say a shout out to Sebastian. Yes. From Australia. Sab. <laughs> Thank you so much for the donation, buddy. Awesome. Yeah. I've got an email from him about it. I was going to read that. Uh, Jeff says, hey, bros, I haven't been listening for long, but I'm about 60 episodes in since your first Cosmography episode. You may recall Kyle asking about a complete Greek mythology book about two years ago or not. Anyways, here are three links to three parts of a 20 hour audiobook featuring the Pantheon mythos. Yes. <laughs> the intro or forward is simply amazing. And I hope this helps you guys keep it going. Snakes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Yeah, I forwarded I, this to Kyle, and yeah, we're gonna be listening to these. Yeah, I, I tried to get that video game. <laughs> oh yeah, Titan, Titan Quest. Quest. Yeah, on my computer, and I couldn't make it work. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I was gonna say Sebastian. Uh, I think he tried to send us some kind of sacred number, perhaps. But it was in Australian. Yeah, but but uh, yeah, it's been it's been changed. Yeah, because it's a weird number. Yeah, but it's a lot. Yeah. I've <laughs> Thanks, got, buddy. Here's the, I'll just go ahead and read his email. <laughs> hey, guys, last email I sent, I said I would donate to the pyramid scheme after I sold my old car. <laughs> <clears throat> I have sold my car now, and I was planning to buy a hoodie and donate the difference up to $100 to you guys. Anyway, the hoodie was something like $80 to $90 Australian with delivery. So, like, he was trying to order a, one of our hoodies. Dang. But that's a lot. Yeah. To get it delivered all the way to Australia is going to cost him like 80 or 90 bucks in Australia. He said, and I just couldn't justify spending that much right now. So I opted for a long sleeve t-shirt and it worked out to like $48 delivered. So I thought I would donate the rest up to $100 to you guys. But the Aussie dollar is slow, so low right now that it seems you got about $80 A for my donation. LOL. Still only about $52 US for you guys, but <laughs> I'm glad to be helping. I thoroughly enjoy your work. And I feel that you are tackling the most important things that we as a society could be focused on. The two most, two most important things to me these days are, colon, when is the next impact due? <clears throat> and how well prepared are we? I know the elites are getting prepared, but I think all of us, Adamu, are probably going to be expended. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> the other aspect of the topics you cover that I find highly compelling is the location of and function of healing locations around the globe. I have heard anecdotal reports of healings occurring in volunteer archaeologists helping at the Bosnian Pyramid site, also from Michael Tellinger in South Africa at Specific Stone Circles, and Kialasa Temple at Ellora Caves in India is set to heal people that cut circles around it reciting the Om Mani Padme Hum mantra. This last one speaks of sound resonance in my opinion, and these topics are high on my list of interests regarding ancient history. 
Of course, the Skirptard community would hate for this informa information to be public, <laughs> if they even know about it. But I'm sure that other organizations would have this knowledge, and I'm sure it is deliberately hitting, hidden from us all. Anyway, that's about it for now. I look forward to getting my merchandise soon. It had better be top quality, or I'll go <laughs> donate to a local Skirptard here. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, guys. From Sap. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna give the, if he doesn't like the shirt he's gonna give it to a local skirt card that's freaking awesome <laughs> oh man <laughs> alright <clears throat> Sab we're gonna have to give you one of our skirptard.com forwarding email addresses. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so send us an email and tell us what you want the first part of the email to be. Yeah. And then I'll set it up and you will basically have whatever you want at skirptard.com <laughs> as your email address that you can give out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't reply from that email address, but I'll have it forwarded to your email. So. Yeah. It's just yeah. fun. You, you can give it out. Yeah, so whenever you're talking to Skirptards, <laughs> you can be like, oh, yeah, send me all that Skirptard information at sab at skirptard.com. Skirptard. <laughs> uh, okay. Got one more here. Uh, this is from John. He says, what's up, fellas? I listened to the Swapcast the other night, and at one point you guys mentioned that you didn't think the good old butt flappers had levitation to move the stones around at Baalbek. I remember researching acoustic levitation a few years back, so I went online and found a few patents for acoustic levitation, and I think you guys would find very interesting. And he has a list of links to patents here. Oh, cool. So, I, yeah, so I wanted to say, um, we're not, I don't think that's what we meant to say, that we don't think that there was acoustic levitation. We just don't know how it was done, uh, but there could have been acoustic levitation. So, yeah. yeah. Powerful enough. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the links. For sure, I'm going to check these patents out, but I just wanted to make sure that you understood. But I don't, I, I listened to the Conspiracy Normal swap cast, and uh, when they asked us about levitation, Kyle basically went into uh, vibrational physics and what he thinks about that. But it wasn't that we weren't saying, I don't think we meant to say that we don't think they had acoustic levitation. Well, what, we, what, what we are saying is we don't know what they had. But those, yeah. that is one of the possibilities. But <clears throat> uh, lack of data makes us not, or at least me, uh, I'm pretty sure Kyle too, not willing to like nail it down to that one thing. Let's say this is what they did, basically. Yeah. So. I mean, it would just, I guess the way I think about it is that it would take a ridiculous amount of of energy in those in those acoustic waves. Yeah. Like Yeah. You know, so unless they were there they uh, if they may have been doing something with something unknown basically. Yeah. Yeah. But to call it acoustic levitation implies sound waves, but I guess it could be some other kind of waves. Uh and the acoustic part just means that you're using reflections and stuff. I don't know. But acoustical usually means no audio, noise, sound. Yeah. But, you know, uh, specific frequencies moving through the air that you can hear. Uh, or right, well, right, right. maybe not. It's, it's, the, it's the frequency which, um, you know, the medium of air propagates energy. Yeah. The frequency range, right? That's the audio range. And it can go beyond human hearing, obviously. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But um, if one, once it gets too high, then the air no longer is... is uh, Going to be able to propagate it. Right. Yeah. And once it gets too low, same deal. Yeah. So, but, and acoustics means like audio, sound, yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 Well, should we look it up? Yeah, because I thought it might mean uh, it, it's, you know, when something has acoustical properties, does that mean it's sound related? Yeah. Period? It's, it, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it means reflections and uh, I don't know. Like, you know, a, a cave is acoustical in that sense. Yeah, let's look it up, see what we get here. Um, but yeah, I agree. Like the, 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 the nature of acoustic or, or of sound waves traveling through the air is the energy levels are acoustics, the scientific study of sound, especially of its generation, transmission and reception. Okay. Uh, the total effect of sound, especially as produced in an enclosed space, the science of sound, the study of the cause, nature and phenomena 
of the vibrations of elastic bodies which affect the organ of hearing. So, yeah. okay. So it's it's it has that, to do with sound. Yeah. So I I was basically saying that it's within air, right? But but we call um, sonic like you know ultrasound. Yeah. That's also sound. Yeah. We can't hear it. Right. But it is still being right. propagated through the air. Yeah. There is ultra and infra sounds. Right. Yeah. Um, but acoustics may mean sound waves being propagated through any material. So, like... Yeah, it could be through the, through any material. Like, I, so it could I, be I through guess, solids yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Sound. Yeah. Huh. That's a good point. Yeah, because, I mean, acoustics is, is happening throughout, like, yeah. the string and a guitar, the steel, yeah. the wood, whatever. Yeah. So it is going through these other materials. But... It's coming off of those materials, propagating through the air, and that's how we hear it. Unless right. you're unless you're biting down on the end of the string when somebody's plucking it, and then it's yeah. going directly. That's mechanical vibration going right. into your head. But there's also like acoustics underwater and so on, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like sound moving through mediums, I guess is what the idea yeah. is. <clears throat> so yeah, I, I agree with you that that the, the that at least in acoustic- whoever moved the ball back blocks <laughs> with acoustic levitation is deaf now <laughs> that's all i'm saying it would take so much energy in in whatever like if you think of a speaker as the you, you know the speaker is the transducer from electrical energy to uh sound energy so in order to have a speaker a loudspeaker that was loud enough to make a a a, a a powerful enough wave and you would have to have, you'd have to do this in, in three axes, right? You'd have one on, on the bottom or whatever, and then two on the sides or something. And you'd have to produce a standing wave and trap that block in within the standing. the standing wave. Yeah. So you'd have to have a vibration large enough to trap the block because the block has to be like whatever you're levitating with acoustics has to be roughly the size of, the of half of the wavelength yeah. of the acoustical wave in which you're trapping it in. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I am very skeptical it, uh, that they levitated this massive block with sound because you, first of all, you'd have to have a sound wave that was so ridiculously low frequency that it would hold, it would fit that block into half of it. Yeah. You basically have to crystallize the air around the block using sound in order to hold so it. So it's like the, the, <laughs> the speakers or the generator that's producing the sound wave would have to have a mechanical device pushing, compressing, and then rarefying the air that's so massive that it would be bigger than the block. Yeah. <laughs> so you might as well just pick the block up and move it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, it's, that's, it, that's why we talked about the idea of like actually making the block itself do the vibrating, and then it would be easy to move. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Even using mechanical vibration, you can get the block vibrating at a higher pitch that's a some, you know... Super harmonic. Yeah. yeah, way up high that's not going to shatter the block. And and now it's vibrating, and then you, and then you can have a... Then you could... You wouldn't have nearly as much friction. friction on the surface where the block is contacting the ground, and you could easily move it, slide it more easily. Easier, yeah. Easier. But it would also sink. Yeah, it would immediately it'd start to heavier than everything else. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. That's why that one block is like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what yeah. they used. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I'm the guy, and you, you're you're kind of right. I mean, I was the guy that was sort of poo pooing the the idea of of. Uh, acoustic levitation in terms of sound waves in air. Yeah. So if there's some other idea of what acoustic levitation is, it's not sound waves in air. Yeah. Then, you know, I've tried it, you know, I get a nice rock and I set it on another rock and I go, Oh, and it doesn't float. So <laughs> you were flat. Right? Just, just a little flat. <laughs> All right, let's take another break. And then we'll come back and talk some about the uh, Vermont trip. Keep 
keeping the Enlils of the world awake by reason of our babble. Snake Bros Institute for Advanced Coprolite Studies. No degrees. Only certificate of, certificates of ignorance that you have to make yourself. <laughs> 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 <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, we got it. Vermont we, trip. Yeah. <clears throat> let's go ahead. Let's do that. Should we do that? So, oh, one, one real quick thing. Uh, Demian. I wanted to, uh, so I got all these email, forwarding emails, and um, I wanted to give out uh, special forwarding emails if you want them. I wanted to offer one to Demian. Yes. So send us an email. Tell us what you want your email to be. And I'll What are the one. options? Well, I have snakebro.com and I have scriptheart.com. <laughs> but I also have brothersoftheserpent.com. That's right. Uh, so they're forwarding emails, which means Kyle will set it up to where... Uh, whatever email you use is where you'll receive the email. Right. But you can give out this different address. Yeah. So again, you won't be able to send emails from that address... But you will be able to, if, if you give it out and someone writes an email to it, it will go to your, whatever email you give me that is your personal email, it'll yeah. just go to that one because I'll put that in as the forwarding email. Right. So I was going to start giving these out to people who donate to the show. So um, if you're interested and you donate to the show. Yeah. Any of the, pat- any of the other Patreon subscribers, yeah. guys, Robert, uh, uh Sorry, I can't remember all the names, but those of you who are on the Patreon, feel free to let us know which one you want, snakebro.com or brothersoftheserpent.com or scriptard.com. <laughs> uh, give the email that you want it to be sent to and then what you want at the front of the email. So like, you know, if you if you want... Johnson. Yeah, Johnson. At scriptard. At Scott, <laughs> scriptard.com. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Jesus, Johnson. <laughs> So they're all domains that we own, but I I, I don't have. See, Demian called herself Sister Snake, and yeah. I don't have SisterSnake.com. Right. <laughs> so it should be Sister Snake at SnakeBro.com. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> we should get SnakeForce.com too. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. you want right there. Yeah. Blah blah blah. It's Snake Bros. Snake Force. Yeah. Snake Bros. Snake Force.com. Uh, I do have one. Actually, I do have one other thing that I wanted. This is because Poddoodle is so awesome. This guy has been Tomas has been making. He's a uh, has been making Poddoodles out of our podcast. So I did it. I finally got around to asking listeners, um, what podcast they would like to see him do. So I want to kind of go through some of that if I can find it here. <sighs> Get it somewhere else. Keep him, keep him entertained. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I was going to move on with the Vermont trip. What am I doing? No, I'm mm. not moving on. Oh yeah. Well. Uh, All right. I'll find it later. I'll do it later. Oh, I'll do it in the last, the last segment. Yeah, I just got to pull it up. It's a thread that I don't, ha- I didn't keep um, track of. So Vermont trip. So here's, the, like I was saying in the beginning of the show, um, these we we went. Uh, we had we had a couple of places we were determined to go to, and our uncle, uh, Uncle John, had done some background research for us, gotten a hold of some people, found some phone numbers, contacts, um, the, where we could get more information. <laughs> and in one case, um, he contacted a Forest Service uh, guy, and we met with that that man and. Spent about three hours with him walking yeah. around the forest. Um, so we so we went to some places that we knew about that are basically considered by the mainstream archaeology to not be anything of importance because they were um, it was basically stuff, homesteaders, yeah, yeah. homesteaders and farmers and stuff that basically threw rocks in piles. Um. So we went and looked at these, this site again. We'd been to it before um, years ago when we were up in Vermont. Um, and this time we came with 
some like a rangefinder, a compass, and a protractor, and started actually surveying the area to see if there was any type of layout, a uh, specific layout on the ground of the of the rock cairns uh, that might be astronomically oriented or or you know uh, laid out like a constellation or something like that. Uh, well, then we found out that someone had already done this research. Um, and I don't think that it's public information. That's right. That was the idea that we got. So this is what we have to look into further. Um, I've, I've reached out, but we're going to try to get more information on the site. I, I think that the people that did the research on it are very open to the possibility that it's more than just farmers throwing rocks and piles. That's right. And so out of respect for those people's work and respect for the the sites themselves so that they don't get um, looted or whatever, we're at this point not really disclosing any locations and stuff like that. Right. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Because it's kind of weird. Like, imagine... Imagine, say, you know, you're just going along and there's there's some pyramid somewhere, <laughs> but nobody thinks it's important. Yeah. And so if somebody discovers, hey, you know, this this thing is actually a tomb, right? And that, that idea starts to get spread around uh, to the public before the community kind of figures out how they're going to protect the site, then you end up people with people like with pickaxes picking into it and then dynamiting the side of it and just yeah. ruining. So it's kind of a weird place to be because we're all about look, you know, we're all about the, the ability to go and see these sites and, and, and uh, look into them, study them. And that's great. But at the same time, you know, uh, if people think th the other side of it is if people think that it's just farmers throwing rocks and piles, it could also be destroyed because no one cares. And this is what yeah. happened with a lot of the mounds in the Mississippi Valley. That's they, right. they didn't think there was anything important about them. Yeah. Well, the, <clears throat> they did at first, and then eventually the scientific consensus led them to believe that they weren't really important, and then they got destroyed. Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of where it's this... The, it's, this is the other way around. Right. Well, it's kind of where this is at right now. Like, yeah. like you know, uh, people think there's something to this, and then the scientific community is like, no, that's just farms oh, throwing right. rocks and piles. Yeah. But now there is there is some interest from other scientists that are saying, no, this is something more. So that's what we want to do really is to, to save the in-depth, um, or at least for me, I wanted to save the in-depth analysis of that particular site uh, for after I can at least establish contact with the, with the people who did the research and see kind of, you know, what they're willing to share, what they would be willing to um, maybe if come, if come on the show, talk about it. Yeah, us, that would be awesome. That would be great. Um, so yeah, it's very, very interesting stuff. But well, do you want to give like some impressions of, or do you want to wait on that completely and just talk about the other stuff? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm fine. With well, that. I mean, you know, it's up to you. Like you're the one doing that work, so uh, we could just save the entire topic for whenever we can get a hold of them. Or, <clears throat> I mean, I'm fine with that. Just wondering. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> safe bet save it yeah okay because i'm really wanting to um not not start out on a uh, you know on the wrong foot with with these people yeah because i I'm, it's full disclosure on my end like hey we have a podcast like we want to talk about this stuff to the public right so yeah my gut feeling is just save it okay until i can at least get a feeling for where they're at and then i'll know what to do yeah. All right, cool. So the other thing we did, <clears throat> aside from that site, was you guys have heard us tell this story before, or um, like dedicated listeners will have heard us tell the story, have heard us told the story before about looking for the cave that the Vikings built. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we've told that story about 
how we heard there was a standing stone or something like that, a stone circle or maybe a standing stone, a monolith somewhere in the hills in Vermont. And six years ago or so, we were up there and we were kind of driving around with our uncle. Uh, he had a general idea of somebody had told him, gave him like a general idea of where it was. So we were driving around the area and we eventually stopped and asked a guy on the side of the road. We saw him pulling up and we asked him on the side of the road and we're like, you know, I'm serious. That we, is there a standing stone or anything like that? And he's like, <laughs> nothing like that around here. Just a cave up there that the Vikings built, basically. And we were like, yeah, <laughs> that thing is <laughs> what we're looking for. And we never found it. So <clears throat> uh, this time, while we were at the other site with the, um, with the, uh, the forestry service guy, who was sort of giving us a tour, he asked us, have you been to calendar one and calendar two? And we had John, uh, our uncle had done some research and found a guy who talked about the, these sites and sent us some links to it. Um, that spoke, it was mostly that guy was talking about what's called America's Stonehenge, which is in New Hampshire. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then there's some stuff up in Maine. Uh, but he mentions in the web, the web page that, uh, that Uncle John sent us. The guy mentions calendar one and calendar two in Vermont. So when this forestry service guy asked us if we had been up there to see those, uh, we were like, no, what, you know, like, how do you get there or whatever? And he's like, oh, it's just right over there, basically. And he uh, turns out to be a geocacher. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm like, I've been a member of geocaching websites for years and years. I just haven't really, I'm fascinated by the idea and on occasion, very seldomly, I'll, you know, have, I'll be somewhere in my car and have nothing to do. I'll have some downtime where I'm sort of got nothing to do and nowhere to go for an hour and a half or two hours or something. And then I'll be like, well, I'll look at a geocache and I'll pull up the map and go try to find one of the nearest ones. <clears throat> so I am a member of the geocaching sites and I have the apps on my phone, but they never get used. Uh, <laughs> and this guy is like, yeah, yeah, you know, you can, he told us that one of them he was like you can follow the geocache there and that actually is what led to us finding this place yeah um because the link that my that our uncle found to the website where the guy mentions calendar one and calendar two he gives you the rough area south royalton is the kind of the township where it's in uh and he gave you the name of the valley but he doesn't actually give you directions on how to get to it but it turns out that like when I opened when I pulled up the geocache map and I went over to that area, I found Stone Chamber One, Stone Chamber Number Two, right? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, here they are. And I, you look at the descriptions. This is Calendar One, Calendar Two. So, <clears throat> and geocaching, if any of you do it, you know that it gives you waypoints if it's a difficult. So this one had these had waypoints like here's where you go to park, here's the trailhead, and then after that you had to find your way through the woods to get to the uh, to the sites. So, uh, we did that and we, so we went, it was kind of a, it was a good hike. We probably hiked, yeah. I don't know, three miles, something like that. Maybe, t maybe two miles. I don't know. It was a half mile from where we parked. And then because of mistakes we made, we walked another mile trying to get to the other one. And then it was a half mile from there to that. And then a half mile back to the car. So something like three miles, maybe, but the these were actually uh well the first one which is called calendar two is actually a chamber yeah. so when we when we got up to it it's actually there's a, a, a little um like a hill and there's just a stone door <laughs> in the side of the hill like stack stones and then lintel over the top the stones are exposed but it's kind of green and grown up all around it and you, you just walked up to that and sort of sidled your way through the passageway, which is very narrow. Uh, and then in the back, it opened up into a very small chamber back there that had a um, some kind of skylight or yeah. smoke ch chimney, something out up to the top. <clears throat> but it was surrounded by ruins all around the woods there. Yeah. Uh, and the lintel stones were huge in that one. So the, the stones that crossed over 
And I mean, you could climb up on top of the thing and it was just, it was just like being on a hill, except that there was a little square hole in the back of a hill. Yeah. Uh, that was the chimney. So that was really cool. And it's supposedly aligned, right, to something? Yeah, is I think. This, uh, I, I can't remember actually what the. It's like the solstice doorway. or. Yeah, it's either. It's solstice or equinox. Yeah. Alignment. Now, I can't of, remember which it's one. in the deep woods, so. I don't know how easy it would be to tell, like if you were there on the solstice. Can or you Equinox. look up calendar two alignment watcher and check that out? Yeah. So, uh, and that was kind of an interesting thing too because we, it was like we found the Kyle was calling them the hidden highways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's like there's as you're walking along the trail, there are like posted, you know, no trespassing signs on either side. And we're like, you're kind of going near, at, at least the beginning, you, we went right by somebody's house. Um, and it was not, it didn't seem to be forestry service land, but but apparently there there are all these trails in the backwoods that are old logging roads that are all now used. Oh, yeah, there's a picture of it. Watcher pulled up a pick. Wow. Wow, that's a lot... Uh, does that look? Is that look like what we were looking at? That's a different one. Yeah, it looks like a different one. Yeah, but still, that's, that's basically it. Yeah. Basically it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does it say calendar two? But anyway, yes, yeah, so that's that's calendar two. So when we saw it, it was much more overgrown. They might have cleared uh, some of the moss or something off of the yeah. stone structure on the exterior. And of course, there's just so much deadfall everywhere in the woods and right uh, yeah but anyway yeah the hidden highways yeah <laughs> so there are these like we actually came to a, a point where there was a junction and there was like this uh it reminded me of like of a, uh, uh, i don't know why i thought of this but uh i thought of the skyrim road signs because there's just this like pole in the ground and there's like there's signs pointing in every direction <laughs> <laughs> You know, this way to that way. This, I mean, they're all over it. It was like a like a, it was bristled with signs pointing in directions and telling you what was which which way things were going. Uh, and I guess it's they, they work as snowmobile trails in the winter, so people go yes. snowmobiling and four wheeling out there. Yeah, we were with uh, some locals, Sarah and Brendan. Yeah, and they were saying that there's, you know. These trails can go. You can take these trails all the way into Canada, without ever. Oh yeah, that's right. Getting on a uh-huh. on a highway or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yep, that's, that's it. calendar two. So, uh, this is the biggest chamber in Vermont and perhaps in all of New England, measuring ten feet by twenty feet, approximately three meters by six meters. This ratio of twenty to ten, two to one, is found in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. There are seven massive lintel stones that span its width. Yep. Yeah, it's awesome. Beautiful sight. And very mysterious. What's yes. the what's the there there is an alignment, right? It's uh solstitial or equinoctial. Can't remember. But yeah, it was uh it was amazing, just I don't know. Um the forestry service guy that we were with was saying that because uh, we were asking him what his opinion of these things were, and he was like, "Look, if they have astronomical alignments, they're not uh, root cellars, or yeah, because that's what they've been called as colonial root cellars. We've we've talked about this uh, Jim Vieira's work, yeah, on the stone chambers of New England. They, these are found all over New England, and you know they've just been basically by the I don't know what community of Scientists are calling it colonial root cellars, but yeah, American archaeologists, historians, historians <laughs> whatever. Um, so there is, there's, they're controversial in that sense. Um, some people have done research looking for um, records of these chambers in the histories in counties and courthouses all over New England, and they have found no record of them. And yeah. so that they, I'm assuming, well, they're using that as evidence that they were built by the settlers because surely if the settlers had found them already built, there would be records of them 
Right. And the, that the fact that there's no records of them is used by both sides of the right. argument. <laughs> That's right. So on one side, the okay, calendar one is aligned to the equinox. The letter. So. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. So I guess calendar two is not aligned. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder why it's called calendar two. I think it is. Yeah. But also, uh, we got a gift from Brendan. Brendan's ma. <laughs> is ma. And it was sent by Sarah. Thank you. Let's see. This. I know what this is. <laughs> it's a one-up box. Yeah, it's a one-up box. Wow. This is a book called Manito, if I'm pronouncing that right. The Sacred Landscape of New England's Native Civilization by James W. Maver Jr. and Byron E. Dix. D-I-X. X. X. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the calendar one and two sites are in this book somewhere. Um, so, yeah, I haven't had a chance to to look into them, but... Yeah, so how well, how did this happen? Brendan was telling her. Yeah, he, at, like so. <laughs> so Brendan went with us to look at the. Yeah, <laughs> these two uh, friends of ours from Vermont, you know, were like, "Yeah, we're we're gonna go look at these ancient places," and they're like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> so they took us there. <laughs> yeah, but they were like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, and then uh, Brendan, I guess, was visiting his mom later, and he was telling her about what we did, and she's like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> so she goes and gets this book off the shelf, which our Uncle John actually sent me the link to this book. Yeah, he was like, oh. you guys should get this. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, here's a bookmark. Calendar one. See, calendar one. So calendar one, um, I think, was excavated because it used to be a stone chamber, but now it it no longer has a, a roof. A yeah. roof. Um. Let's see. I don't know. I have to read through this and, and yeah. And mark, and Calendar mark one's stuff. chamber was a beautifully constructed. Uh, <clears throat> it was uh, the chamber itself was very square, had sharp corners, and they sort of. They spread out as they went up, which is uh, interesting for a roofed structure. You know, like you, you you normally think of them going in. You know, you start with a wider base and then the and then it goes inwards to make the roof smaller because that's an easier thing to do. But this structure actually went outwards as it went up. So it gets wider. The floor space was smaller than the ceiling space. Of course, there was no lo, no longer a roof over it. So it looked more like a... Um, a square well. And unfortunately, when we got there and we found it, it had recently, <clears throat> one of the walls had had a serious structural failure. It had caved in basically on one side and it was a fresh cave in. So it had just happened, but you could tell that over, over time, the basically when you're facing the stru- the whole structure of the interior, the, the, the walls of the passageway and the chamber itself on the right had been bowing inwards slowly. And I wonder if that's because they removed the roof beams, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, it was kind of scary to walk through the passageway because you were the, as you squeeze through the, pa- you had to turn sideways to walk through the passageway and the wall on the right was squishing you against and because it was bowed in so much it would squish you against the wall on the left as you went through and it was a very <clears throat> unsettling sensation you you it looked like it could fall at any minute uh because the the passageway itself was still closed over but the but once you got into the chamber it was open to the sky because the i guess the roof beams had been removed at some point so <clears throat> and the the cool thing about the geocaching is that people take records, people record when they've been there and some people take pictures and stuff. And so when I looked at the geocaching records that people were saying, oh, the wall on the left or on the, the wall on the right is actually bowing in a bunch and it looks dangerous, but the pictures still had the chamber intact. So when we got there and we found it was 
had collapsed. So that's very unfortunate. It, it probably isn't going to last much longer at this point. <clears throat> Once that collapse starts, it rain and other things will start to erode it pretty fast. So pretty soon yeah. it'll probably just going to be a pile of rocks. Yeah, calendar one was definitely excavated. I'm seeing it here in the book. They, uh, 1978. They excavated it. So, some big standing stones and stuff. Anyway, this is, uh, let's see, calendar one has a ridge line to the east, which makes the sunrise off from due east. Yeah. Yes. So they are, so the point, okay, so ah. because the mountains are so much higher than, than the true horizon, uh, the, where the sun actually first shows up from your point of view on the ground is further, is, is not where it would normally be if you were standing at, at, at the ocean watching the sunrise on the equinox, Okay. <clears throat> So the sun's rising in the east and it's moving south as it, as it goes up. It's coming up at an angle uh, in the northern hemisphere. So because the, the mountains are high, the, when the sun first peaks over the mountains, it's much further south yeah. than if you were on f flat level ground. So the chambers are aligned to the visible equinoctial sunrise over the mountains in the distance. So you can't like if you go there with a compass and you're you're not there on the sunrise to see, you can't tell. Like, well, you won't know where the actual sun would peak over the horizon yeah. or the over the mountains on that day. So it's aligned to where the sun peaks up, or is it aligned to the actual? No, it's aligned to where the sun comes up over. Okay, the mountains. yeah, all right. Because it actually does. And uh, there's there's apparently some other alignment stuff around the area. So we know that that chamber was built after those mountains got put there. That's right. <laughs> There's one piece of evidence. Yes. It narrows the date down a bit. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was a the, really fascinating. Um, I don't know. Great experience finding those things finally. Yeah. After all these years of hearing about that. Right. Calendar, cave that the Vikings built. Yeah. Calendar 2 was really really a beautiful thing yeah uh calendar one was also beautiful but it was sad because it's clearly falling apart yeah uh, and i wonder you know i mean where were the if they excavated it where were the roof stones they just tossed them to the side or something i mean yeah i'm i'm assuming it was roofed yeah um i'm, I'm gonna have to read this book yeah so but it was a great expedition uh great adventure yeah and uh the uh the success of a six-year-long quest <laughs> <laughs> to find the cave that the vikings built <laughs> yeah so that's the that that's been one of the theories and and we happen to have been talking about this the sort of the salutrian yeah yeah so that was built by the salutrians it's freaking old Okay, well, maybe that's not it. Because they're, they're, the Salutrians were 24,000 yeah, okay, years ago. Okay. Um, and they may have, and the idea was that they influenced the Clovis technology. That's right, that's right. So Clovis were pre end of Younger Dryas or whatever. So that would put it at you know, 12,000 years ago. Yeah. They're Vikings were a lot more recent. Right. <laughs> well, I was thinking of uh, the. What, what's uh, I'm trying to think of the other guys that have been attributed to perhaps the um, the copper mines, the Michigan copper mines, and, oh, and some of that other the Minoan civilization or the Phoenicians? Yeah, no, the Minoans from yeah. Crete. Yeah, from Crete. So they don't really yeah, the Celts. The work of the Celts. Oh uh, yeah, that's the Celts. They don't. Uh, okay, so yeah, so there are. <clears throat> we did look through some of that stuff. Some people think that they can see Agum, Agum script in some of the stones. Other people, script cards are like, those are just scratches from the chains of the farmers that were moving them around. Yeah. Uh, so the, it's all up in the air, but I think the standard model at this point treats them like colonial 
artifacts. So historical, but not mysterious. Right. Um, and of course, I've read people making the arguments like, look, plenty of the people that lived up here, these farmers or whatever, were Masons, both both in real terms as in terms of like they did stone masonry and they were also Freemasons. And Freemasons are <clears throat> Okay, calendar two is winter solstice. There it is. There yeah. we go. Yeah. I knew it. I knew it was something. Thanks, Watcher. Yeah. Yeah, you just posted a picture of the winter solstice sunrise coming up over the mountains. Yeah. So basically you have calendar two or calendar one on one side of a of a of a mountain, basically. And then around the, that mountain on the other side of it is calendar two. And then, so you have calendar one pointed at the equinox where it rises above the, where it becomes visible over the mountain. And then calendar two on the other side of that mountain is pointing at the solstice, the winter solstice. So uh, it doesn't, it seems weird for uh, colonials to build stuff like that. And like this forestry service guy told us, he was like, look, you know, if they have alignments, they're not, he thinks that there's something else. Yeah. That they're older and it's like, you know, those farmers aren't, they're not trying to aim their yeah. freaking cellar I mean, doors at the solstice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we did go to some, some old homestead sites and they, they were good stonemasons. Yes. I mean, they built some pretty hefty walls and yeah. um, foundations and stuff. Yeah. So, um, not to say that they weren't capable of doing what, you know, to, of building these sites, but it is, uh, quite a bit of effort for such a tiny room. Right. And the cellar sites that we saw, the old homestead sites that were cellars there, it, it's, it was a farm and there's other, there's obvious other places there. And also, so the forestry service guy was like, look, we, we, um, they have very old pictures from the late 1800s of the actual buildings that right. were in this place. But where Calendar 1 and Calendar 2 were, there's just no sign of, you know, at right. least none that we could see. I don't know if anybody has found any signs of homesteading around them. But why are you going to put your root cellar out in the middle of the mountains, nowhere near your house? Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, is the cellars that were under, you know, the in the, in the homestead yeah. was basically a pit yeah. that was dug and then there was a there was sort of a retaining wall built around the interior of the pit, right? Out of stone, and then the house was built on top of it, right? So your cellar was under your house. Yes, these are not that, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> these are stone chambers. Like the entire thing was roofed over with massive stones. Yeah, and it's just a little hill. Yeah. So, a man-made hill, basically. Uh. And there, so around calendar two, there were other, what looked like maybe collapsed stone things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, it didn't look like there was a homestead there. So anyway, it was a fascinating trip. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, we're up on a break. We're up on a break. We also went to the quarry, so we can talk about that too yeah. when we get back. Serpentine. <laughs> yeah, serpentine quarry. Ladies and gentlemen, final segment. Uh, and I must apologize for not being prepared. <laughs> for, uh, yeah, it's just been real busy since we got back from the trip. So yeah. haven't really um, had much time to, to think about and look into all of this stuff that we did go see. But uh, it shall be forthcoming. So, yes, um, we did just get this book as well. I knew it was coming. Thank you, Brendan and Sarah and, and Brend Brendan's mom. <laughs> Matt. Uh, so yeah, interesting synchronicity there. 
so I'm going to go through that and uh, also hopefully get a hold of the, um, the people who did uh, work on some of the other sites and have some really cool stuff to present to you guys about um, our own backyard. Yeah. So that's that's one of the things that, that's been on my bucket list for a, a long time, uh, since long before we started the podcast, was to go vi- uh, begin visiting these stone chambers and things in, in New England. Also, of course, all of the... Um, you know the Mississippi Valley mounds and yeah. all, all all of these yeah. earthworks uh, that that are here in the United States. Um, so we got to do some of that when we were in uh, Pagosa Springs uh, with the Grimerica boys and yep. Randall Carlson, and that was really awesome. Uh, so this is this is just another thing like this: seeing that stone chamber, the the Calendar Two site. For the first time, we came around the bend, and there it was, like that yeah. that dark doorway. It, I mean, just the way the woods were, you, these huge, tall trees and the, the canopy, it was all dark under there, and the ground is real soft, and the leaves were all changing colors, and it was just the 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 whole feeling in the woods in that part of the, of the country is uh, already sort of... Uh, Magical, yeah, magical experience yeah. for sure. And and so you come around, and then you just see this otherworldly thing. <laughs> you yeah. know, this mound that is just who knows how old it is and what purpose it. You know, why was it there? And it's just the whole mystery of the thing and and uh, the beauty of it all at once uh, was was a great experience. And I can't wait to go visit some of the other ones around New England next time we're. Uh, in that part of the world. Yes. So definitely recommend uh, any of you in that area or if you're ever visiting that area, New England area, um, look up New England Stone Chambers. Uh, there's, they're, Like I said, they're all over the place. Look up Jim Vieira. He um, has some YouTube videos uh, presenting slideshows on, on many of these chambers and talking about the stonemasonry involved uh, the methods invo- that must have been involved in building them, uh, the weight of some of the stones, and a lot of just a lot of data about it that's very mysterious. Uh, the astronomical alignments. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. So we were we were very glad to finally end yeah. our quest. Yes, our initial quest <laughs> to find the cave that the Vikings built. In quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because we we made a wrong turn. When we were in the area, and of course Russ and I weren't driving, we didn't know, you know, we're just in the back back seats or whatever. But we're going around, and we're like, no, this is not it. Where are we going? And Russ's GPS isn't working well, and he's got the he's got the um, the geocache site up, and he, you know, he's waiting for the 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 blue dot to move to where we actually are. Yeah. Um, and in that process, we made some wrong turns, and we're going, we're driving along, and and. I start to recognize the, the area. I'm like, wait a minute. There's that guy's house yeah. that we pulled over and talked to. And he, you know, he was the one that was pointing, yeah, go up there over at the old man's house. Don't let him see you though. You know, <laughs> we were just like, man, I don't know about trespassing on these people's property. So it was really great to have Brendan and Sarah there as well, because um, they understand the hidden highways. Yeah. You know, as I call them, I think they were called pass roads. Uh, if I remember correctly what they called them, but um, there, yeah, so we, we would have been, I'm extremely uncomfortable with the idea of just like hiking onto someone's private property. You yeah. Know, we're, like we're real walking s- on their four wheeler. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're real serious about that around here. And I, I wouldn't want to do that, but we had the, the, the forest service guy had told us, no, you know, you can, you can get there. There's a path and you know, so it's totally legit. Yeah, we knew but, that. But when we got there, you know, I was like nervous because I'm like, man, we're just turning up this road, and yeah, we and there's start like posted, you know, no trespassing yeah, and, signs all along and, it, and and so uh, Sarah was just like, we, we pass a sign that's on there, and it has like a number on it, and it has a little snowmobile, yeah, which we call snowball wheels, snowball wheel. Uh, it had a little snowball wheel, you know, image on there of a guy on a snowball wheel <laughs> with a number, and she's like, oh yeah, this is one of the, you know. So the way it works, I guess, is these once these paths are used over a certain amount of time, it's sort of uncontested. Like, yeah, it's yeah. sort of like grandfathered in as yeah. a almost like an easement. They cannot 
close the path to to um, travelers. Yeah. So it's 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 kind of cool too to think about you know these these different um, sort of hidden things about about our culture. Yeah. And and you imagine you know like in a in a disaster scenario. Yeah, somebody can you know th- these people that live in the area and know about all this and you know it's sort of an unspoken thing, but they all know like you know where yeah. is everything like all the highways are dead, but people are getting around. Yeah, you know? yeah, you can block all the highways <laughs> you want. And you're not going to yeah. stop those remotions from getting around. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> we're going up to Canada tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. Was a really great experience. Um, can't wait to do it again. Yeah. Yeah, the watcher says Vermont apparently has forty some odd stone chambers. So yeah, get the geocaching stuff, people, if you want to go see them. That's a uh, the well, a lot of them are marked with the uh, on the geocaching places, and they give you directions and stuff like that, which is really cool. Yeah. So serpentine expedition number four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so right next to. Uh, Right next to our uncle's property is a serpentine quarry. So it's serpentine is a green marble. And uh, I mean, it's not it's it's through the woods, basically. But the guy who now who owns the quarry currently is good friends with my uncle and they kind of hang out. And so they so he told him like, hey, these guys are my nephews are coming up and uh, they'd love to talk to you because, you know, he knows that we're interested in. How people quarry, how like the the the, we're interested in this aspect because this is something that ancients had to do, and so we're and we're also interested in people moving heavy loads. So this guy, that's what he does. He cuts giant blocks out of the out of the out of the earth and moves them around. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep, that's it. Washer just pulled it up. Yep, <laughs> a winter that's picture. It. That is the so that quarry has been in operation since the since the late 1800s. Uh, it has gone through many owners. The current owner is awesome, a guy named Tom, really cool guy, uh, highly energetic. You know, just like works harder. Than, he's the boss and the owner, and he works harder than anybody, all of his crew. Um, and he took us on a whole tour of the quarry, showed us all, told told us about his plans. Uh, we asked him questions about, uh, so, so he showed us the, like one of the faces they're working on. So like, you know, a, a quarry face is the, this is where you're actually getting material that you are wanting to sell or use or whatever. Um, so the quarry itself has a deep pit. There's a, there's a 200 foot deep hole that has been quarried over the years. Uh, yeah. Watchers pulling up pictures of it. That's it. And I, we got some really great pictures of it cause we actually, we actually went down in that hole watcher we actually climbed down in there all the way to the bottom so that was really cool uh yeah you see that you can see the the stairs at the back the scaffolding the the scaffolding in the back we walked down that (laughs) (laughs) it was awesome uh so talking to him about the way so one of the cool things is they, they have two main machines that they use to cut uh one of them actually runs a wire he called it a wire but it's It's, actually it's kind of like a chain it's yeah it's 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 round or basically you can imagine cylindrical sort of like a cable the 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 cutting tools or the cutting edge is kind of like think of like a just a plain ring on your finger like yeah a, it's like that but it's it it's got diamonds embedded in it and it's uh, it surrounds a a, f- me- a metal chain that can you can connect the links together but the links are all cylindrical shaped and they're flexible where they connect. So it's like a rope that has these rings on it that have diamonds embedded in it. And, uh, they have a machine that, that runs that chain, like a chainsaw almost. Yeah. Or a rope saw. Yeah. (laughs) Rope saw. (laughs) (laughs) So he showed us a cut that they had made. So the first thing that he said that he called it daylight to daylight. So the first, they get up to the area where they want to face the stone, you know, because up to this point, you've got like broken rock, and now you want to get a face that's a smooth working surface. Uh, so they get on one side of it with the drill and they just drill all the way through 
from one side all the way to the other. So daylight to daylight is what he called it. And I mean, how long do you think that was? Like 40 feet? Yeah, um, more probably. Yeah. yeah, 40, 50 feet long, just this long drill hole. And then they they fish that chain through there. Yeah. And then pull it up or whatever. They bring it up over the top over the of top the hill. Over the top of the hill, yeah. <laughs> so they fish the chain through the drill hole that they've made way down at the bottom of the hill, bring it up over the top of the hill, and then connect it to the machine on one side or the other, and then turn that machine on and just pulls that chain through there and cuts through the rock and makes a smooth quarry face. And then they can start quarrying blocks or slabs out of that surface. And the, the chain can be used to make vertical surfaces or horizontal ones. So he showed us a couple of the horizontal ones where he's like, see how this is all, what did he call it? Rolly? What yeah. was his term for I don't it? Know what it <laughs> he term. used some term because it, it, was, it wasn't flat. Basically, it was you could tell it had. I think he, I think he used the term bushka one time. Yeah, he's kind of Italian. Yeah, bushed. Yeah, bushka. He's like, yeah, see this bushka over here is no good. That's right. Yeah. So the surface, like at one part, the surface of the ground was sort of a had these very smooth contours, and he was saying like, we're gonna have to recut this because it needs to be flat. Yeah, they have a different type of saw that's actually more like a, 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 chain a conventional chainsaw, but it's huge. Yeah. And it also has, you know, diamond cutting plates on it. So once they get this sort of rough cut, wavy cut uh, block out of there, then they'll take it over. They'll move it over to their other machine that cuts a very um, regular surface and cut through it with that thing. Yeah. And he cut slabs off of it. Right. And, and you can see the marks of the tools on the stone. So you could tell the difference between the chain because the chain leaves these long lines that are arced, very, very long arcs. And then the arc will slowly change as the chain cuts through the stone. You can see it. Whereas the one that's like a chainsaw where it has a bar and the thing is going around it, you can see that as a, a series of, that, of this rounded bar shape or long rectangle with a rounded end going down you can see how that is moving through the stone uh so this <laughs> a giant chainsaw is basically and we looked at a couple of them they're huge um and he took us down into the quarry hole itself and we were looking at some of the older ways that these quarry guys did it and they actually would drill like so that when they wanted to cut a block off they would drill a hole that's say four feet deep and then pull the drill out and then move over an inch and then drill another hole that's four feet deep and then pull the drill out and move over an inch and just do that over and over and over and over again. And then they would use something to break the block off the face. Yeah. So it had the, so you could see the, it had this pattern on the face of, you know, all these half, half drill holes all the way across hundreds of them, maybe thousands going yeah. around the, uh, so that must have taken a long time and been a pain in the ass. Um, so that was a really cool experience talking to Tom about. And there's a there's a big gantry uh, crane that hangs over the big hole that he uses to move big blocks up and in and out. But I guess the he, the blocks he works with are um, uh, Uncle John was telling us they're, so they're they're like below ten tons. They're yeah yeah you know between I guess ten tons or lower. Uh, and then we went up to, he's got a part, a piece of property that has an old something, another mysterious structure on it, uh, that he calls a kiln. It may have been a lime kiln or a charcoal kiln or something way up the side of a mountain. And it's built into the side of the mountain out of pretty enormous stones. It's a pretty yeah. big construction. Uh, it also has suffered damage recently. They cleared out around it, and there was a big tree above it. And after they cleared out around it, a big windstorm came and blew that tree down. And so it pulled half the structure down, Yeah, unfortunately. So he wants to rebuild it. Um, and we might we might uh, be able to help him with that because that would be cool. A cool yeah. project. Go up there and help him rebuild the thing. But yeah, we went up there with him and looked at that and talked about what he thought was going on there and... It's not really clear what the thing is, and now that it's fallen in, it's hard to tell. But it used to have an entrance at the bottom. Yeah, a small, small hole. Yeah, and he was talking, and so they, and they had a source of water, so there's a little pond, and then up above there's a spring somewhere, and then there's this clay material in the area, and he was thinking that they may have been uh, 
making they they were mining they were mining some kind of something from the from that area and that's why they had the kiln there and they were doing some sort of uh smelting process or something that required heat so very interesting stuff <laughs> we had a conversation with him about the pyramid builders <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is really funny and uh he he totally disagreed with us on our on on the idea of you know the ramp building thing. He's like, oh yeah, the, obviously they built ramps. You know they they you know he's like. So then we start talking about moving heavy loads without your crane and all this kind of stuff and and using uh, wood rollers and he was just all about it. He was like, yeah yeah. He's like, I can do it. You know? <laughs> I challenged him. <laughs> I was like, I, uh, let's. I was like, you got blocks that weigh tons. Let's get one, and then I want to see you roll that block somewhere <laughs> on wooden rollers. <laughs> and like, the, it was hilarious how he reacted. He took me up on the bet, and then bet me a thousand, and then ten thousand dollars that he could do it. And then later said that he didn't even need to bet me about it because I knew. He pointed at me. He's like, he knows it can be done. <laughs> like, because his wife was actually like, you should do it. And he was like, I don't need to do it. I mean, he fr he knows. <laughs> <laughs> it's like his way of getting out of the whole thing when I challenged him to it. I was like, dude, you've got all the stuff. We've got plenty of wood here. Let's cut down some trees and get one of your really big blocks and let's roll it across something and see if those blocks don't just fall apart. And he's like, oh, yeah, the, the, the logs don't fall just, apart. The, the, yeah, I'm sorry. The, the, the logs don't just completely turn into splinters. And like he takes me up on the bet, ca calls it $1,000, raises it to $10,000 within a couple of words, and then later says that it doesn't even need to happen because I agree with him that it can be done. <laughs> so it was hilarious. <laughs> a lot of fun talking to the guy. Yeah. <laughs> I think part of what it was, because he said a couple of times, he's like, look, they didn't use like some woo, you know, like magical. And I was like, no, yeah. Cause so like, this is one of those deals where, you know, you have to tell the person like, look, we're not talking about aliens and we're not talking about magic. We're saying that they were more technologically advanced than they're given credit for. Yeah. But he's also the type of person that's just like, he's, he's one of those people that just does things you yeah know, like yeah i'm gonna buy a court yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and just start cutting these massive blocks out of this hole <laughs> right <laughs> and so you know he he looks at he has a way of looking at these types of projects obviously and he's just like yeah you know i i could i could do that right you know if i if i had to <laughs> yeah. if i was there I yeah. can make it happen with, with hemp and ropes and copper tools. Right. And he knows that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to do it. He knows. <laughs> but we did get into a more interesting conversation about the rollers. Um, and, he, you know, I kept bringing up the idea of, of uh, pounds per square inch. You know, how much surface area are you covering? And so his point was the smaller the rollers are, the more surface area you, you can, can cover you, yeah under the rock and on top of your so you can spread out the weight you can spread yeah. the weight out yeah so so you know it's it's just it's like a the difference between a machine with tracks versus a machine with tires so if you take some huge loader machine and it has four tires the amount of surface area of those tires that's actually making contact with the ground is far less than that same size machine that has tracks. Yeah. So that, you know, on on track machines like excavators and stuff, they, they talk about the the pounds per square inch under the under the machine, on the tracks, touching the ground. Yeah. And they can significantly reduce the pounds per square inch. I mean, to the point where you you like when you're doing certain jobs, say where you have to be let's say you're making a, a retention pond and you've got all this thin um, pipe under the ground, a bunch of pipes running and they're all thin and they're perforated. And then you've got gravel on top of it. Well, if you try to drive a machine with tires on that gravel to grade the gravel out over top of these pipes, you'll crush the pipes underneath. Yeah. So you rent a machine that has wide tracks, long tracks, and you can get a heavy machine down in there on top of that gravel and it won't displace the gravel underneath the tracks and then 
it won't. Yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? It's spreading that load out. Right. So it is true. Like his point was was I thought it was a good point that that you know it's kind of like it's almost the opposite of what you would think. He's like, well, the bigger the stone, I'd reduce the size of the rollers. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's right. <laughs> and that's exactly right because you can put a lot more of them under there. Yeah. And thereby spread uh, spread the weight out um, along the surface of your sand ramp, <laughs> <laughs> which is where I called him. I was like, dude, yeah. come on, you're building a ramp out of sand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a it was a great great time and um, yeah, really interesting guy and and uh, interesting project that he's that he's working on out there in the, in the quarry. Yeah. They're actually right at the at the, so that quarry is you know obviously it's it was early 1900s or late 1800s or whatever and it's got that just this huge hole and it's so far down there and their their crane time having to lift up and move over and all the stuff of these blocks they're they're yeah. they're wanting to reduce their crane time so that he's actually cutting this massive trench in the ground. To, from way far away from the quarry to meet up with the quarry to like, like break halfway in, down. Yeah, break <laughs> into the side of the quarry halfway down. Yeah. So that he doesn't have to lift the blocks out of the quarry as far. Right. <laughs> so That's the trucks can pull up. Yeah. You know, it's cut his he's trying to cut his crane time in half, basically, by doing that. Cause it, it takes that thing a long time to to pick those blocks yeah. up out of the bottom of the So it would it would still be it would be really interesting to sit down with with Tom, and just look at all these different quarry sites, these ancient quarry sites all over the world. Yeah, and see what he thinks. And just about. yeah, just get him to comment on what they were. Oh yeah, I know exactly what they were doing. Right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we look at them and we're like, what the hell were they doing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I'll have to send some pictures of ancient quarry sites to John, and he can show yeah. them to Tom and. And then John can relay to us that Tom understands exactly what's going on. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> what time we got? We're, we're we're there. Oh, okay, we're there. All right. Uh, I had a stretch here. A seventh inning stretch. Yeah. <clears throat> Snake stretch. Yeah. All right. Uh, so next week, I'm hoping, I uh, think... We are going to have a show with GMA. He's got some. Oh yeah, he's got some. So that may we may be recording that this weekend when he's here. Yeah, he's coming down. Yeah, so uh, look forward to that. It will be. Oh, that's going to be a good show. Yeah. So you guys remember episode eighty, Impossible Blocks with uh, Archer, and he did a fantastic job from his engineer's perspective on precision work in ancient engineering, and he has been working on. Uh, another more show content because I was like, bro, we want to have you back on because your show is one of the most popular ones we've got. So he's been working on this for a couple of months now at least, I think, and he's got some really cool stuff planned for for us. So look forward to that. Um, so you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Check out the website, brothers of the serpent.com can comment there, uh, comment on the shows there. You can uh, check out the Encyclopedia and the Glossary. Uh, also, the merchandise, the snake skins. Check out the snake skins and look at our merchandise page. Buy t-shirts or hoodies. Hopefully, they're high quality. If they're not, <laughs> give them to a script art. Um, <laughs> follow us on Twitter, at Snake Bros, S-N-K-B-R-S. And uh, share the shows anywhere you can. That always helps. Uh, also, donate to the Pyramid Scheme. Patreon. Uh, Patreon there, link is there on the website. Uh, or you can just give a one-time PayPal donation. We appreciate everybody who has done that. Thank you guys so much. Uh, especially uh, uh, Sebastian and Damien. Damien. Yeah. yeah. And our Patreon supporters, Robert. And I'm sorry, I need to remember. I need to get a list of you guys' names so I can give you shouts out. Shouts out. Shout outs. Shouts out. Yeah, <laughs> those. <laughs> <laughs> and give us reviews, uh, especially on the iTunes store. That helps a lot with spreading the podcast. Uh, many of you are doing that. Thank you so much. Um, and remember, if you write something with your review, I mean, like, we appreciate all the five-star reviews you guys want to give, and we have been getting a lot. So 
We really appreciate that. But if you write something with your five-star review, uh, <laughs> I'll read it on the show. If it's a one-star review, I'll still read it. If you give us a one-star review, I, you better write something because we need to know <laughs> what we're doing wrong so we can do it more because you're an asshole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, uh, and, and definitely if you, if you do donate to the Pyramid Scheme, uh, leave a comment there. Yes. Because I'll, I'll read that on the show. And That's if right. you don't leave a comment, I will still look at your donation and have a snake smirk <laughs> <laughs> with uh, warm and fuzzies. That's right. So. Also, uh, History Shift. You guys know about History Shift. We talk about him at the end of every show, at History Shift on Twitter. Follow him at his blog, HistoryShift.com, where, where he... Uh, details his adventures looking for dolmens and glacial erratics in Montana. Uh, he makes all of the, our, our podcasts into YouTube videos, so you can find us on YouTube. Look up Brothers of the Serpent on YouTube, and you can watch the podcast videos. Poddoodle. Yes. Also. Right. Poddoodle. Uh, so he has been turning our podcasts into, like, animated. You can watch him sketch while you listen to the podcast, basically. That's <laughs> it. He doodles. While he, while he, while listening to the podcast, and he's using our audio, so you can go to hit Pod Doodles on YouTube. I think it's Pod Doodle, or is it Pod Doodle? I don't know. But you can look it up, Pod Doodle, on YouTube. And uh, so, I just wanted to say, I asked our listeners, I was like, we want to hear from listeners, what Snake Bros episodes do you want to see done by Pod Doodles? And here are some of the suggestions we got. The C word says Gandabrink, and has the <laughs> dancing in front of the pyramid gif. Uh, History Shift says, how about one of the, how about the Randall Carlson episodes, which is, would be great. Uh, Patrick says, Impossible Blocks would be pretty funny. That's, That's GMAs. GMAs. Yep. The Eyes Wide Pilgrim, which has been sending us awesome stuff from Malta, by the way, which we need to get into some of that stuff. He says, numbers 92 and 93, please. The sign and the seal. Oh, yeah. Love a good pot doodle and the Shamir. <laughs> Aaron's old man says anyone where damn it Johnson gets mentioned <laughs> so <laughs> Tomas you're gonna have to look through all of our back catalog and find every episode where we say damn it Johnson <laughs> and turn that into a pod doodle uh, I don't even know what, what episode numbers those are <clears throat> so Loki says uh, the impossible box episodes with your dad so that would be uh, pyramids are hard yeah, uh, pyramids are hard with your dad. Springs to mind. <laughs> yeah, we need to do an episode with Tom. Pyramids are easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Tom would be pyramids are easy. Yeah, he knows. Uh, so yeah, he says some of the construction jobs your dad des- described cry out for visual reps. Uh-huh. Snakes, reps, huh? Do you even lift, bro? And uh, <laughs> rendezvous with death says crystal skulls. Did we do an episode on the crystal skulls? Yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah. That's been a long time ago. So there you go, Tomas. Do all those. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Better have them up by next week, but I'll be calling your boss. Uh, but yeah, so look him up, Pod Doodle. You can also follow him on Twitter at Pod Doodles. <laughs> they better be good, or we will send links to a script art. <laughs> <laughs> He does these great little shorts, too. Like, recently, he was, like, getting ready to do the next Snake Bros episode, and it was just a real short animation, and he draws some pyramids, and then that goes away, and then he draws a guy wearing a bowling pin hat with shoulder rivers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just went around in a circle, like, pyramids, bowling pin hat, shoulder rivers. It was great. <laughs> God. Dude tracks me up. Uh, also, the Facebook group, which is... Man, I should have this pulled up, but it was the same thing. I always gotta need to write this guy's name down. So the Facebook group run by Jordan. Thank you so much, Jordan, for doing that. Really appreciate it. So yeah, you guys can join the Facebook group, Brothers of the Serpent. The Watcher is there. The Grand Watcher is there. So the Grand Watcher, yeah, the Grand Watcher in the Facebook group. Yeah. So Grand Watcher has uh, has had a long, long time interest in these kinds of things. So he is fascinating to talk to. So I'm sure you guys can get into some great conversations with the Grand Watcher on Facebook. Not so much the Watcher, though. He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so, <laughs> he can't respond right now. I know. His mic's off, so I, I can talk all the shit I want. All right, guys. Thank you so much. We love you guys. Always have. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work.